Psalm 127, Psalm 127, it was read in your hearing earlier, and uh, I'm going to center on uh, verses 3 through 5. Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5. And it reads, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Father, I pray now over these next few moments that you would guide my tongue and my thoughts, that you would take control of this moment, Father, in this space, that it would be sanctified, set apart for your voice and yours only. I pray, O oh God, that all hearts and minds would be gathered together, nothing wandering or nothing being distract, uh, becoming a distraction. But, Father, may we all have on one mind, and that's to hear what you have to say to us today. So speak to us in this place. Speak to our hearts. Speak to our families. Speak to our culture. Speak life. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning on a subject as we really unpack these three verses here. Uh, on cherish your gift. Cherish your gift. And as we understand what this text is saying to us, we'll understand what that gift is that we are to cherish. Uh, we, we do this as, again, as we have come off this time of ministering to young people, and we're seeing uh, what that entails, what that calls for, and what God is calling for us to do. We're called to minister to children. We saw that on last Sunday as Jesus himself took the stage and said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And he was teaching his disciples uh, through the example of the children. And here uh, we're going to look in the scripture, in the Psalms, and get an understanding, uh, even from Solomon, as he talks about several different things as we look at this understanding of children yet again. Uh, we're to cherish our gift. Verse 3 lays it out for us. Number 1, if you're writing down notes, jot this down. Point number 1, God is the giver of children. God is the giver of children. Verse 3 says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. Children are gifts from God that God gifts us with. Children, however they arrive. You've heard me say this before, but let me say it again. However they arrive... They are a blessing from God. I have to say that again because in our culture, we, we, we tend to think of things from an a, 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 a adult perspective that because of my circumstances or because of my mistakes or because of my issues, my lifestyle choices, that this baby or this child is somehow cursed or this baby or this child is somehow be, uh, born with a disadvantage. Let me tell you what God sees from his, his perspective. They are a blessing to you. They are a gift to you. God ordained you to have that child. God gave you that child, and they're a blessing from God. End of discussion. Amen. Because God can use any life that he gives. God has a plan for every life that he gives. And there's no life that has been born. I don't care what the decisions have been with that person's life. There is no life that God has given that God didn't have a plan for. Our job as parents is to understand the plan and to understand how we play a role in guiding and shaping that child's life. But that life in and of itself is a blessing from God. In Scripture, in Old Testament text as well as New Testament context, we find many situations where there were uh, 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 women that were barren. I think of Hannah. I think of Elizabeth. I think of uh, 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 of. Uh, of others that, that were, were not able to have children. And, uh, and, and the whole, I think of Sarah, I think of all these scenarios how they were not able to have children. And in that culture in that day, if, if you were a woman without a child, something was wrong with you. Something was desperately wrong. It was a spiritual thing. It was almost as if you were cursed because you could not have children. But to bear children is was to be favored by God. To be able to have that closed womb, to be opened up, 
that was once barren, now you're able to bear children. Where you were cursed, now you are favored. It's always seen as as a mother bears a child, a, a family has children being born into it. That is a favored household. And we need to see it the same way today. Children are the blessing from the Lord. Parents, we need to understand several things as we understand this idea, uh, this, this whole concept that God is the giver of children. It, it really takes us out of the equation initially. None of us decide what our children uh, will be like. None of us decide uh, what our person, the personality of our children will, will be like. None of us have that. that. That's out of our jurisdiction. All we do is appreciate and parent the child that God gives to us. Amen. That's where our role begins. That's where our role begins. And it's important that parents of all ages understand the, 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 the foundational principle here is that God is involved in the family. In other words, God is in charge of the development of the family. There are no mistakes when it comes to God. There might be some mistakes in our, in our, on our calendar. I, I, I didn't plan on having this child, or I'm too old to have a child, or I wasn't, I wasn't desiring a child. But guess what? God gave you one anyhow. God is the one that has given you the child that he's given. He's given you the child that you have because he knows what you can handle. Yeah. Now, I want you to listen carefully. God has given you the child he knows you can handle. Yeah. So, so there's nobody in here, there's no one that, is, listen, is even alive today as a parent that can say, honestly, before God, I cannot handle this child. Because God has given, God, listen, God has given his favor, his blessing. It's not a curse. It's not a, it's, not a, it's not a heavy thing. It's not something that God leaves you high and dry on. God gives you what he knows you can handle. And listen, even a special needs child. Let's just go all the way. Let's go all the way. Because there's a lot of parents today that, that when, when that mother is in labor, when that mother is carrying that child, there are people that gather around and pray over that mother and pray over that child. God, give me a safe delivery. Give me a healthy baby. What are they saying? And Lord, give me a child that doesn't have any problems. A child without defects. A child without special needs. But listen, God gives even special need children to parents he knows can handle it. Y'all need to walk with me today because this is not a curse. Even in that, this is not a curse. This is not a, a weight. It might be difficult. It might be hard. It might be challenging. But parents, if God gave you that child, God's also giving you the ability to raise that child. Even a special needs child. And let's be honest. We, we call it that. We label a whole lot of things today. Special needs, special needs. But let me t look around. And look, 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 look around in the room. Look, at, look, look around in the room. The reason why we say special needs child is because that child, listen, has been diagnosed with this or that. But there's some folk present here today that missed the diagnosis. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell it like it is this morning because some of us think that, oh, oh that, that because they got Down syndrome or they got this issue or they got that problem, they got a special needs, they're not like everybody else. Let me tell you something. There's some folk walking around full grown that never got diagnosed. There's some folk with some issues uh, that never got the medication. You never got the Ritalin. You never got the antidepressant. You never got diagnosed for whatever it is and you learn to live with it. Some of you were born before they even discovered the medication to treat it. Some of you didn't have the, the means to go to a doctor and spend all that time trying to figure out why you're just a little bit of crazy. Let me, what am I saying? Everybody is a special needs child. Amen. All of us got something we need help with. And it might not be in a book. It might not have a picture next to it. But all you know you and God knows you. And some folk in your house know you. There are some needs that we have that are not in a scientific book or medical journal. But God knows. You ought to thank God that you're still doing as well as you are. With your condition. <laughs> God is the giver of children. No matter what that child is, don't look down on somebody because they got some diagnosed problem. That's right. 
What am I saying? Don't criticize some child. Don't think less of some child. Because if God can use you and if God can use me, let me tell you something. Some of us have learning disabilities and we don't even know it. You wonder why you can't sit down and pray and focus on reading a book for more than a half an hour because there's something there where you just got to keep going. You just got to keep going. Can't sit still. Got to get up and move around. Why? Because you got a problem. You don't know. You don't want to call it. You don't know what to call it. But you know what? At this stage of the game, who cares? God's brought you this far. He's going to take you all the way. You ought to thank God. He's in charge of whatever condition you got. He's in control of whatever you got. Because all of us got something. <laughs> Y'all feel a little more comfortable right now as we talk about special needs. I want to break down that, that false reality that we built up because of the culture, what the culture says and how the culture views it. Everybody a little bit crazy. Still love Jesus and still crazy. You want to <laughs> you know why church is all jacked up today? Because it's, it's people, real people with real problems, real issues. That didn't get diagnosed. All right, let's move on. <laughs> God is in charge of the family. God has given you to that child as well. Not only did God give you that child with the issues, God gave you that child, but God gave you to that child. It's a two-way thing. God gives you with a child. He knows you can handle. He's preparing you to handle. And parents, you've got to trust God day by day. Because it, it, it's not going to come natural, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come supernaturally. Yeah. Which means that you're going to have to depend upon the Lord in the rearing and the raising of that child. Or maybe you're a grandparent and you play a dominant role in raising a child. And you know there's some special needs here. There's some special issues here. You are a gift to that child just as much as that child is a gift to you. And you have to see yourself that way. God has given you the ability to love, protect, and to lead that child. Through whatever the challenges are that that child will face. He's given you the ability to love, protect, and lead. Say those three things with me. Love, protect, and lead. That is the job of every parent that God has given. Listen, giving you children, he's given you the ability to love, protect, and lead that child. Because he's in charge of the family. That, that, that's, why, that's why we, listen, that's why we ought not fight against what God has given to us. The gift, don't give it away. Don't, don't discard it. Don't, don't, don't kill it. Don't, don't, don't listen. No, because God's given you a gift. You don't discard a gift. You don't throw away a gift. You don't forsake a gift. You actually cherish a gift. You love a gift. You keep a gift. You value that gift. Children are that gift. It should be cherished. But God is the one. God's in charge of the family. Secondly, God brings joy with each child. We say, preacher, I missed that one because mine gave me a headache all the years I was raising that child. Uh, let me tell you something right now. You might have had a headache, but that child was not your headache. The challenges were real. The pain was real. The reality of, of, of not having the resources was real. But that child, from God's point of view, was a blessing to you. Let me tell you something. You say, preacher, I don't understand what you're saying. Any situation in parenting that leads you and drives you to your knees is a blessing to you. It, that, that's the same with any lifestyle issues. The pain is real. The issues are real. The difficulties are real. The challenges are real. I'm not saying those things are nice and enjoyable. They're not. But if it leads you to a dependency on God, if it leads you as a parent where you were neglectful, where you were immature, if it makes you grow up faster, if it makes you take responsibility, if it makes you Pray. If it gives you the ability and the idea that I can't do this by myself, I've got to depend upon the Lord to help me raise this child. This child is not my headache, but my challenge is I need to grow as a parent. This is the reality. Parents are not made perfect. God doesn't give you a child because you're a perfect adult. He gives you a child to help you become a better adult. Then after that, you still make mistakes. You still falter. You still fail. You still make wrong decisions. But listen, you're growing just as, that, just as well as that child is growing. Parents, mom and dad, you're still growing. You're growing in your dependence upon God because that's, what the, that's, that, that's a part of the territory. God brings joy with each of these children. Verse 5 says this. Look at verse 5. He says, happy. 
is the man. Oh, blessed is the man who has his quiver full of them. We're going to talk about that in a moment. That quiver was that sack where those arrows uh, were placed uh, for uses. Those arrows, we're going to talk about those arrows in just a moment. But there, there's joy. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. Because children are blessing from the Lord. Amen. In other words, we should take joy in seeing our children develop. Parents, grandparents, any family members, those that have influence and impact on children, we ought to take joy in seeing our children develop right. It ought to bring a smile to our face. It ought to bring joy to our hearts to see children learn how to make right choices, right decisions. To, to, to know that they're on the right journey. They're not perfect. They're not done. God's not done with them. But they're on their way. And it ought to bring joy to our hearts. And I, I, I get excited to see the children that were here learning the word of God. It brings joy to my heart when I see them memorizing God's word. Because that's something that's a seed planted in their psyche, in their minds, in their hearts that they will never forget. When they see God doing something, when they see God answering prayer, parents, don't hide everything from your child. Understand, they need to see you struggle as well. They need to see you go through pain as well. But they need to see how you handle it so they'll know what to do when they get your age. They need to understand that they can make it by seeing your example. And as we see children get it, understand it, grow in their faith, Grow, even coming to Christ. It produces joy in our hearts. We should also take responsibility for guiding their development. We should, I'm going to give you some practical points here. We should take responsibility in guiding their development. The joy is lost many times because parents have unplugged from being practical, hands-on influencers in the lives of their child. They leave it to the school system, and that's the ultimate failure. Even the Christian school system is not adequately staffed and prepared to raise your child. I told you last Sunday, I told you before, the church, the church, as, 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 as great an impact as a church can have and should have, the church's responsibility is not to raise your child. The church's responsibility is to come alongside you as a Christian mom and a Christian dad and to help you Listen, to reinforce what you've already established in the home. You should take responsibility, parents, for the responsibility of guiding your child's development. How your child turns out is a direct, listen, response, response to what you have poured into them. If you, if you, listen, if you spend no time on the spiritual side and you wonder why your child has no spiritual life, it is, it is no, it's no abracadabra and it's no, it's no hard, difficult equation. If you didn't put it in, it's not going to come out. If you didn't spend time planting the seeds, don't expect a harvest. And you know what a lot of Christian parents do? They do nothing at home and come to church and expect God to do everything for them while they have no personal responsibility for the spiritual development of their child. Just because your child sits up in a classroom or in a sanctuary somewhere and is forced to keep a Bible open in lap and stay awake doesn't mean they're going to automatically fall in love with Jesus Christ. Amen. And you wonder why at 18 years and 19 and 20 years of age, Young adults make decisions to leave the church because that's all their experience consisted of and they had no deeper, listen, priority in their lives as children that were moldable and shapeable and in the age where they could soak it up. There was nothing planted. There was nothing planted. And you know what happens when you don't intentionally plant something. It's twofold. You take that ground that is fertile soil and you plant in it. You put a seed there. But listen, at the same time, you have an expectation for a harvest of what you have placed and planted there. You also take note of the illegal things called weeds uh, that are growing up without your permission. And what you do, you, you have to de-weed. You have to take that stuff out and to keep it clean so the seed that you intentionally put there can have the room can take the resources and can, can, and can grow in that child's life. You got to weed your children. You got to keep them clean. You got to take personal responsibility in how they develop. You can't take it up a passive approach and say, you know what? They're just going to grow up and choose for themselves. That's a lie from the pit of hell. 
Because, listen, if you leave them to themselves, the weeds will find them and choke them out. The weeds of this world, the weeds of this culture, the weeds of the fallen flesh, this nature that is waiting to take over. If you don't prioritize and tend to the garden and love the gift that God has given to you, the weeds of this world and the devil will take over your house. And it's hard enough and difficult enough when you are doing it the right way. You're still fighting an uphill battle because the enemy wants your son, wants your daughter, wants your grandchildren. Doesn't care how much you love Jesus. Doesn't care how many VBSs they attend. Doesn't care how many verses they memorize. He wants them and he'll pull them. Parents, you got to have an active role. Take a personal responsibility guiding your children. We should celebrate, on the other hand, celebrate our children every chance we get. Talking about the joy that comes. Find things. Here's what, and I'll talk to parents. Those of you that are overly critical, let me minister to you right now because you might be doing more harm than you are good. Celebrate and learn to celebrate the good things. Learn to celebrate the things, the, the developmental things. Every step, celebrate it. Celebrate it. Don't, don't, don't think it's weird or strange. No, you don't have to wait until some huge, some huge breakthrough. No, celebrate the steps. You, you know how it was when they were small and they were just learning how to walk? They didn't, they didn't run a mile for you to clap your hands and ooh and ah over them. No, it was the one step. It was the two step. It was three steps. It was going from here from mama and going over to dada. It was, it was, it was a small accomplishment that you applauded, that you got excited about. Don't lose that awe. Don't lose that excitement because the joy that you experience at the early age is the same joy they're looking for at this stage and this stage and this just because they're grown now or almost grown or think they grow, don't think that they don't want your approval. Yes. Learn to celebrate your children because that's the joy of finding out how to cherish them. You find somebody, I don't know anybody that doesn't want to be celebrated. I don't care what they say. I don't care how much they pull back. I don't care how thick the facade is. Everybody likes an applause. Everybody likes to be celebrated. You know what? You did that right. You did good. I'm proud of you, man. You, you, you're on the right track. No, listen, no one devalues that kind of encouragement. That is soul food. That is, it, is, it, it, it lights the heart on fire and brings joy and a smile to their face. He said, preacher, I got a teenage son, I got a teenage daughter, and they don't smile about nothing. <laughs> they don't get excited about nothing but a video game and sleep <laughs> and food every now and then. Let me tell you something, beloved. You and I push through. Amen. Because parenting is our responsibility. Amen. Celebrate them. Let them see you. Let them hear you. So don't just pray to God about them. Let them hear you talk to them. And it ought not be that we're always fussing at them. It ought not be that we're always condemning them. It ought not be that we're always correcting them. There's a place and a time for correction and discipline. But if that's all you have with your child, you are unbalanced as a parent. And your child is not getting something that that child desperately needs. They need to see that mom and dad are excited and happy and pleased about some things that go right in my life. And I'm not what I think I am because many children grow up believe that I'm a failure. I can't do anything right. And everything that I do turns out wrong. And nothing I do is ever pleasing to mom or dad. And all I get is a headache. All I get is an earful. All I get is correction and condemnation. But listen, parents, as Christian children, as Christian parents over children, you and I need to learn the art of celebration. Amen. Somebody say amen. Amen. Celebrate your children. Now I know I, we, we're, we're, we're talking to. I'm talking to a multi generational church, and some of y'all ain't got children in your house. But you got a spirit. You got a, a, a window of time. You got with your grandkids. Celebrate them. I didn't say spoil them. I ain't talking about spoiling. I'm talking about getting them, looking them in the face. You know what? God loves you, and I love you too. You know what? Pouring into them the very 
energy and strength and spiritual stamina that they're going to need because some things will stick. Just like the negative sticks, let me tell you, the positive sticks too. Just like that condemnation sticks, when you say you're nothing, you'll never be nothing. I don't know why I ain't bother with you sometimes. Stop speaking that stuff. I don't care how you feel. Keep it to yourself. Tell the Lord, but don't tell that child. Y'all ain't going to say to me much of this, but there's some folk in here that have been scarred in your own development. And guess what? The same pain that you felt as a 15, as a 12, as an 8-year-old, you're passing that same pain on to the next generation. Stop it. Because that's not God. That's not God's design. And that's not God's word. God says that child, that grandchild is to be cherished by you. Not, not discarded by you, not cursed by you, not de- de- devalued by you, but loved by you. Because God didn't make no mistakes. Amen. God brings joy with each child. Thirdly, God assigns each personality. God assigns each personality. Listen to me carefully. When we talk about cherishing, cherishing this gift that God has given to us, God has a purpose for every child. You say, my child is a little weird. My child is different. You know what? Praise God for those differences. Because God made them different. God made them different. God gave them exactly what he knew they needed. He's going to give them the platform wherever they are. And it's going, that's going to be their launching pad. The, the issue is that parents is, is not, is not saying, you know what? They're not a, they're, they'll never be able to do this. They'll never be successful. No, 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 no. God will cause them to succeed. As you as a parent value where they are and the personality that God has given to them. Listen, God has a purpose for the introvert. God has a purpose for the extrovert. God has a purpose for those uh, who, who, who have tough personalities or personality conflicts. God has a purpose for all of it. Parents, this is the time to pray. This is the time to seek the Lord and say, Lord, how would you have me to influence them? I'm, I'm, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to turn around. I'm not, I'm not going back. No, I can't, I can't go back. I can't. The, the, the child's here. The grandchild's here. My child's here. Whatever. I, 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 Lord, give me direction now. Remember, they are still developing and becoming what God wants them to be. Challenges are no issue for God. Amen. Maybe it's a learning disability. God's got a way. Maybe it's a focus problem. God's got a way. Uh, maybe, maybe they just don't mingle well with other people and make friends easily. God's got a way. You, you never know the story by, behind some of the greatest people that we, 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 we see in our culture. We never know. We look at a Billy Graham. We look at somebody you know, that's got a, a longevity of being. We don't know what their childhood was like. We assume a whole lot of stuff because they seem to be successful now. They seem to be doing okay now, but you don't know what they had to go through to get to where they are now. You don't know the struggles, and even for us in this room, if we were to break down and really be honest in church like most folk are not, and really tell our story how, you know what, I failed the fifth grade, and I, and I got sent back, and I, and I got expelled because I couldn't just keep my hands in my, all these things that we would look back and we like to forget. But those are the stories that we need to tell the next generation. We need to share with one another so that we can know that I'm not by myself. I'm not the first one to raise a child like this. I'm not the only one that had to deal with this kind of issue. The body of Christ needs to open up and share our personal stories. Stop acting like everything's all right at home. Stop acting like parenting has been a breeze, like my family just started this way. Ooh, God's just been good. Yeah, God's been good. How? Because he's heard your cry in the midnight hour when you were rocking your pillow with your tears. You didn't know what to do. You didn't know. You were fear. You were raptured with fear. But God, through the years, has proven to you that he's faithful. That he's not going to give you something and then leave you by yourself. He's not going to give you that child with all those problems and then leave you by yourself. You are not alone. You're never alone. And listen, for those who have no children that desire to have children, keep these things in your mind. Because these are the things that are going to fortify you when the Lord blesses you with that gift. God assigns those personalities. Confirm and affirm your child. 
give them what they need so that they can grow in the way God wants. The second half of this verse, verse four, actually verse 4, goes on to say, Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Notice what he says in the imagery here. He says, like arrows, and we'll get that in a, mo- in a moment, but like arrows in the hand of a warrior. The, the imagery and the, and, the, and, the, and the parallel here is, 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 is an archer using arrows in, in, in war, and, 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 and the parallel is parents uh, using or, or handling uh, uh, successfully their children. The warriors would be the parents. Uh, the arrows are the children. Parents, let me talk for a moment. Parents are to be warriors and skilled archers. You never looked at yourself that way. But your child can't fight for himself yet. Your child can't defend himself yet. Your child can't take care of himself fully yet. Your child is not at that age of development, that level of independence. They still need you. And some of you got some almost grown people, some young people in your house. You got some folk that ought to be independent yet, but they're not quite there yet because they're still latching on to you. You still have an air of influence, beloved. You are a warrior. You are to see yourself as a warrior. Parents, it's time to go to war. Grandparents, it's time to go to war. If your child is not mature enough or spiritual enough to handle your, ch- their, your, your grandchildren, grandma, granddad, listen, you need to go to war for your family. You might not have a direct role, but you have an indirect role. It's time to go to war. Aunts and uncles, it's time to go to war. Whenever you have that area of influence, take it seriously and take it as a skilled warrior would. That's how God sees us. Warriors. Nobody goes into war, listen, haphazardly. Nobody goes into war without preparation. Nobody goes into war underestimating the enemy. The child can't see all the danger, but you and I are placed there to be their protection, to lead them, to guide them, to love them. And God will use our influence over them as the arrows that they are destined to be. But before we get to the arrows, parents, we have to understand our role. We are the warriors. We are the first line of of defense. We are the first line of those who actually take responsibility over what they should be. If you want them to become straight, strong, and sharp as arrows, you and I have to have the quiver to possess them. We have to have the ability to keep them close so that they can be used for God's purposes. That archer has that bag, has that, has that sack, has that quiver that is full. And those arrows are designed and they're close so they can be used by the warrior. Parents are to have that kind of influence over their children. And a lot of parents, and let me, let me say this, let me say this. Parents, just because of difficulty and pushback doesn't mean that you don't have that responsibility under God. You still have that responsibility given to you by God don't throw that down don't set it down God has given you that ability to be that warrior that skilled archer with those arrows that God has placed in your care arrows are developed on the other hand not discovered let me say it again arrows are developed they have to be made they have to be designed they are designed with a specific purpose in mind. That that arrow place is placed in that bow and that bow is pulled back and that arrow has to be three things in order to be successful. Number one, that arrow has to be straight. You say, duh, it has to be straight. Yeah, it's got to be straight. Because by design, if it's not straight, it will not be, re- when it's released, it will not have a straight course to its intended mark. It's got to be straight. And beloved, you and I as parents and those of influence have to understand that we need to instill within our children moral character. The ability to grow up as the as the way the the way that God would have them to mature, the way that God would have them to grow. 
Children must learn. It's not an option. They must learn right from wrong at an early age. Why do I say an early age? Because after a certain level of development, beloved, you have, listen, your parenting days are over. Your parent, when they get 18, 19, listen, if you, if you didn't tell them why they were 7 or 8, your parenting days are over. You can try to find somebody. You can try to p- drill it in their heads, but you're going to do more damage than good because your parenting days at that point are over. You and I have to understand that parents uh, parent differently at different stages. And while they're at a young age where these kids are today, they're soaking up like a sponge. But when they become uh, 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 preteens and, and teenagers, they begin to question everything. They, wh- why? You tell them what to do? Well, they, you, you've been telling them for the last 10 years, but now it's why? Why I got to do that? All, all kinds of questions. Why? What's that all about? Well, well tell me. Uh, you need to tell me a little bit more than just because I said so. That ain't going to work with them anymore. You know, you got to have, you got to take a different approach of parenting now with the child who's at a different lay, different stage of, of development. They need to understand at an early age before they get there the difference between right and wrong. Instill morality in them so that when they grow up, they carry that with them. Amen. They're not going to be perfect. And I'm not, this is not a formula for problem free parenting or problem free children. That, that doesn't exist. That's, that's a lie. That does not exist. Even the best child is going to have challenges. Even the easygoing child is going to have challenges. Yes. But if you instill in them at an early age, here's, what, here's what's right, here's what's wrong, and make it clear and repeat it. Repet- repetition at an early age is important for the kid to understand, the child to really understand what it means, what the Bible says. That's why we, 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 we teach the children. Why? Because we want, the, we want the little children not only to come to Jesus, but we want the children to understand what Jesus says so that they can understand what the, why the Bible says what it says and what it means to them. Teach them. Repeat it. Let them hear it again and again. And again and again. And don't get tired as a parent of saying what God says. Why? Because they need to be reminded over and over and over again. Because when you release them into the world, beloved, they get bombarded with the same lie. Over and over and over again. You and I need to be diligent. Listen to me, parents. Listen to me, grandparents. Listen to me, children of God. We need to be diligent in in repetition of the truth. Because the truth is the only thing that's going to keep them when they leave your house. And you don't, need, you don't need to be him and hawing when they go to college. Did I do my best? Did I really teach them like I should? Did I, did, was I an example? Listen, by that time, if it ain't done, it ain't done. But you have an opportunity now. Teach them right from wrong, right, right from wrong at an early age. Children must learn respect at an early age. Yes. Oh, I'll park here for just a second. Children must learn respect at an early age. It's nothing worse than seeing a little child that everything they do is cute. And, they, and, and, you know, children listen to things you don't know they listen to. They hear you talking when you don't even know they're around. And parents, be careful what comes out of your mouth. Y'all kind of quiet this morning, but be careful about what comes out of your mouth. Because children will soak it up, turn it around, and spit it right back out at you. And you better not look at them like, you better stop doing that. Because what they think in their mind, I got it from you. Little, ch- little children that learn to cuss before they learn to read. You say, you joking. I ain't joking. They can't read a book. They can't read a line. But they know how to, they know how to curse like a sailor. Why? Because they heard mom and dad say it. And they grow up and they interact with other adults or other children using that same standard. Teach them respect. Teach them how to carry themselves with character. Teach them how to carry themselves with dignity so that when they get around other people, they still represent the standard that you instilled in them. That you give them what they need to, to, to be straight, have moral character, even in your absence. That's when you know they got it, when they still stand on what's right, even though you're not standing right over them. 
Anybody can do what's right when someone stands over and make them, intimidate them. But when they, listen, when they're standing, even in that moral character, in your absence, then you know it's a part of them. And that's the desire of each household. That's the desire of God's house. That's the desire of, of teaching and preaching God's word is that it becomes a part of them. Parents, let it become a part of you. Stop having an expectation for your child that you don't have for yourself. If you want your child to be godly, you be godly. You be godly. You want your child to be, have moral character, you have moral character. You want your child to be honest rather than dishonest, you be honest. You want your child to learn how to get along with folk and make friends and have valuable relationships, you know how to carry yourself in relationships. Let them see the example in your life. Children learn by listening and watching the godly example of their parents. You can't take that away. That's how God designed. And if you do that, they'll become straight with more character. But secondly, strong. Straight and strong. Strong means endurance. That, 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 that arrow has to be strong in a structure. The character of that arrow has to be, be able to, to withstand the elements once it's launched. The crosswinds will be blowing. There will be all kinds. It might be raining. It might be all kinds of things that it's going into. But it's got to be able to cut through to keep on keeping on and not be deterred because of the winds that are blowing, the crosswinds that are blowing. Beloved, many of us have fallen because we were not designed to be strong as children. There were deficiencies in our own lives because of the way we were talked to, the way we were seen, and the way we were devalued. Beloved, build character in your children so they become strong and they're able to endure. Number one, teach them never to quit. You want your child to endure? Teach them that quitting is not an option. Somebody ought to say amen right there. Teach your children. Teach your grandchildren. Listen, it, it, don't, don't just pop them in front of the television set and leave them to be educated by somebody you don't know. Teach them, listen, that quitting is not an option. That they do have what it takes. They might be a little crazy. That's all right. But tell them I'm a little crazy too. But all of us don't have, listen, none of us have the ability nor the option to quit. That God didn't make us as quitters. God didn't save us to be quitters. God's not with us so we can quit. God didn't design. It's not in the blueprints for you to give up, unplug, and quit. You can't quit. Put food on your table so you, you can keep on going. Lights are still on so you can keep on going. You're in that school so you can keep on going. We come to church to send God work so you can keep on going. Quitting is never an option. Say that with me. Quitting is never an option. And that's not just good food for the children. That's good information. That's good soul food for the parents. Yeah. Parents, don't give up on your child. Because if you give up, they're going to give up. What am I saying? What you do, they gonna do. I'm not saying they don't, they don't have personality of their own. No, they do. They do. They make decisions and choices. They're not robots. No, but you have a you have the direct influence over their lives. Don't quit. Don't quit, because God is with you. Teach your children never to quit. Number two, teach your children how to handle failure. Teach your children how to handle failure. Teach them. Listen, that everybody's fallen. Everybody's failed. Everybody's blown it at one point or another. I'm not even going to ask you to raise your hand here, but if we were to give testimony and pass the mic around, all of us would be able to tell us, each and every one of us, about things that we failed in our lives. Things, dark areas that we don't like to even talk about anymore. But let your children know how to make it through failure. You've heard me say before, if you're going to fall, fall forward. <laughs> fall forward, don't fall back, fall forward. Fall towards your goal. Fall towards. Listen, so when you get up, you're still closer than you were before you had the challenge. Failure is not an option. Listen, but we can learn through our failure. We can learn through our mistakes. And children need to understand they don't have to commit suicide because they messed up. They don't have to put a gun to their head because they messed up. They don't have to go out here and kill other people because they feel a certain way. They don't have to handle failure that way. But they can get up from failure and failure. They can have a comeback. They can make it again. They can stand again. They can be successful in Jesus' name. Many of our children don't believe that. Again, because parents haven't poured that into their children. 
Because if you don't build them up, if you don't, if you don't speak life into them, if you don't, I'll say it again, if you don't speak life to them, if they don't hear your voice, Saying, I love you, I love you. I didn't grow up in a home, listen carefully, I didn't grow up in a home where I heard I love you. I didn't hear it until I became a teenager. My grandmother, actually when I was in my 20s, my grandmother passed away and at her funeral, that's when we started, started saying, I love you. It was understood. I love my mom to death. But it was understood. I love you, you love me. You put food on my table, you cook me breakfast, you make sure my clothes are washed, you know, I got a roof over my head, yeah, you love me. But I never heard it until later in life. Listen, it's everybody in here. Pour that kind of value into these children. Let them hear your voice because your voice is what they hear. If you're in a crowded mall and you're trying to find them and call their name, they can pick up your voice. Because they've heard you from day one. Let them hear you as that primary voice speak life into them. So when they face challenges as adolescents, as young people, as teenagers, as even elementary school students now, you got, you got elementary kids having a depression and struggling with depression because they don't know how to handle the emotions that they feel. They don't know what to do because of issues and conflict among their peers. They don't know how to handle even conflict at home. Mom and dad get a divorce and they think it's their fault and they're bringing all that heavy weight to school. And they're not designed. They're not even developed enough to handle that kind of reality. And they'll believe a lie and it'll take them into a, a deep depression. If you don't think it's real, talk to some of these young people. I'm not talking about high school students. I'm talking about people in fourth, fifth, sixth grade who are dealing with stuff that you and I never even thought of in high school. And then they become adults and they have issues because it never got dealt with. Churches are filled with adults with youth problems, with young problems, with elementary age problems that never got fixed. Fly just flew in my Bible. Speak life into them. And I close with this. Make them sharp. Straight, strong, sharp. That tip of that arrow has to be sharp by design. So that arrow, once it hits the target, cannot bounce off, but make an impact. You want it to stick. How do you know you hit the bullseye? Because the arrow's still in the bullseye. How do you know you made it? Because it's still there. It might have been launched from a great distance. It might have had to go in high altitude and come back down. But it made the mark. Why? How, how, how do you know? How do you know, parent? Because that child is still walking with the Lord. You had some, ch some challenges. You had some problems. You had some headaches along the way. But you as a parent, as a grandparent, had an active role of sharpening. When you study the word of God with your young people, what are you doing? You're not wasting time. It's not punishment. No, you're sharpening them so that when they're launched into this world, they're not like everybody else. We got a lot of dull folk walking around. A whole lot of folk with a lot of talk, with a lot of, uh, with a lot, a lot of stuff to say. But the, there's no sharpness to them. There's no uh, impact. In other words, when they're launched, they don't have what it takes to stay with it and to make an impact. What are we doing as children of God, as, as a body of born-again believers, as Christian households? We're training children to have an impact. To have an impact. We want them to be independent in life. If your child's 33 and still in your house, no. If your child is not independent by a certain level, let me tell you something. We're training them to be sharp. Prepare them to be successful in their career. Take an active role in what they're interested in and find out how you can help to lead them and guide them in that direction and prayerfully be that support to them. You're not doing it for them, but you're there to cheer them on. You're there to, to, you're there to be with them every step of the journey. Prepare them, finally, to serve God. 
You want your child to be sharp? Career is one thing. Job training is one thing. Making money is one thing. But that ain't it. That ain't it. If you do everything else and leave God out, you have done your child a disservice. And I end with this. Because listen, Christian parents, you're called that because you love Jesus. Because you belong to God. And today, if you didn't know it before, your child is a gift from God. And the greatest way to, to thank God and to give God praise for what he's given to you is to give that child back to him. Is to give that child back to God. The ultimate desire for every Christian parent is to have that child grow up and fall in love with Jesus and to find through whatever, whatever their skill level is, whatever their interest is, to first of all make a commitment to God and to serve God through that field of expertise, to serve God through that skill level. God can, God can use a Christian doctor. God can use a Christian lawyer. God can use a Christian congressman. God can use a Christian president. God can use a Christian policeman. God can use a Christian teacher and educator. God can use a Christian. Whatever the field of expertise is, let it. Listen, go to college. Get the degree. Hang it on your wall. But at the end of the day, drop on your knees and give yourself to God. And say, God, use me. Let my life be used for your glory, for your honor. Not satisfied just having a bunch of accomplishment that I can look back at. And even, even let, let me just be honest with you. You can have your all full of degrees and still can't get a job. Why? Because, listen, it's God that opens the doors for you. It's God that has you in the right place at the right time to walk and meet the right person. It's God that, that listen, verse 1 says, unless the Lord builds a house, they let labor, labor in vain. Listen, parents, we're not doing this thing in our own flesh. We're not doing this thing in our own energy, in our own power. We're doing it in the power of God. Unless God is involved in the rearing of your children. Unless God is protecting your children. Unless God is keeping those that he's given to you. Unless God is watching over them when they're not in your visual sight. God is the one that keeps God is the one that protects and ultimately God is the one that guarantees success over your family. Yes. Do what you can do. Do what you ought to do. But at the end of the day, that child got to have a relationship with God for themselves. You can't make them. You can't force it. You can't fake that. Take the time now to cherish the gift. If you don't know how, Ask God. You say, preacher, what are you talking about? The Bible says, if any man lack wisdom, yes. if any man, or if any woman, any mother, any, any, any father, let's be practical, any, any parent, any, any grandparent, any, any, any uncle or aunt, whoever you are, whoever you are, then you have influence over those children. If you lack the ability to do it, if you lack the interest, if you lack the desire, if you don't even think it's important, let me tell you something. Ask God. And he'll give you wisdom. He'll give you the ability to have a clear understanding of what your role is. And let me tell you something. Unless we discard this in the universe, this is a great message for somebody else. God has you here. And you've heard me say it before. I'll say it again until it gets in our hearts. God has you and I here as direct and indirect influences over the lives of these children. Don't underestimate it. Don't go, you know, you might be, you might not have any children at all. I'm still talking to you. If you know God and love Jesus, you have a direct or indirect impact over the development of every child that God sends in your space. Don't shake your head and say, I wish the parents would, don't. No. You open up your mouth. We have some children here at BBS that go back to parents that aren't saved. You know what? God's going to keep them. 
God's going to shield it. God's going God's to keep the seed that's been deposited in them. He's going to bring it. He's going to grow it. He's going to mature them. He's going to do the work. But you and I have an impact. And if you're not touching any young person, let me tell you something. I, 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 I told you last Sunday, don't just get comfortable hanging around folk your age and talking to folk your age. Have a generational perspective. Find a young person that needs to know Jesus. And you mentor them. Some of us don't understand what mentorship is. But mentorship is important within the body of Christ. Mentorship is important within the kingdom. Because some of these children don't have godly homes to go back to to get it from. You're the only one in their lives at the present moment that has that relationship with God. Please don't forsake that responsibility. Cherish the gift. Father in heaven, we bow right now. And I pray, I pray as earnest as I can because God knows this, this, at this moment, this is probably one of the most important messages that you've had me preach this year. Because it has to do with the success of this up and coming generation. And the enemy's attack is on generations. And he doesn't start at 40 and 50 years of age in that generation, he starts at two and three. He pulls them away. He desires, he, divides, he desires to divide and conquer. But Father, you said, let the little children come unto me. Because you know what they are. You gave them as a gift. And you want to bless that gift. You want to grow that gift. You want to see that gift reach full maturity. So that gift can be given back to you. I pray that you will bless every family represented in this room both seen and unseen, that, Father, you'll touch that child that is wayward. You'll touch that child that has challenges. You'll touch that child that is a disadvantage. And, Father, that you would be all in all to that child. That, Father, you would make the difference in that home, that single-parent home where that mom is raising those children by herself, that, that, that parent, that dad that is being both mom and dad, those grandparents that have, have had to raise another generation, didn't ask for it, don't even want to, but they're doing it because no one else is there. God, I pray that you would pour life into those scenarios. And Father, for those that are raising two, in two-parent home, doing relatively well, give them the stamina, give them the energy, the strength, supernatural ability to keep on trusting you. Never to give up, never to quit. All heads bowed, all eyes are closed. And I'm talking to parents right now. Parents, do you need to say, Lord, give me the energy and strength that I need? Give me the ability to trust you and not give up? Would you just lift your hand up, parents? I want to pray for you. I need prayer, I need the strength of the Lord. I felt like quitting sometimes, but I'm not going to quit because I know God is with me. I see those hands. I want to pray a special prayer for you. Would you come down to the altar? I want to pray over you today. You're the main concern. Join me down here. I want to pray over you. Maybe you need to stand in the gap for somebody else who's a parent. Maybe they're not here. But you know what? You can be that person of faith that will stand in the gap for them and say, Lord, you can make a difference in that house. You come on down. This prayer is for you. This prayer of benediction and blessing is over you. It's over you. You come and receive it in Jesus' name. Receive it in Jesus' name. Everybody standing on your feet everywhere. There's still time. If you need to come, you come on down. Get as close as you can. Because I believe God's not... We're talking about generational curses. I believe God, God's, got, God's got some generational blessings. But he's got some folk in here that will receive that blessing. You be that pan. You be that woman. You be that parent. Receive that blessing today. Come on down. Hallelujah. 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 Come on down and get as close as you can. Bless the name of Jesus. Just play a little bit softer, if you will. A little bit softer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray right now in your name and your authority. 
that Father, you would cover each and every person standing at this altar. You know them by name and you know their families as they are representing their families and maybe even standing in the gap for somebody else who's not here. But I pray right now in the authority of Jesus' name that you'll give them the ability, the supernatural ability to cherish the gift, to cherish the child that you have given to them. Challenges are not uncommon, but Father, you are a problem solver. Father, you are a need meter. You are a God that promised that you would supply all of our needs. And parenting is one of the greatest needs that we face. And I pray right now in Jesus' name that you will, Father, pour faith into everyone standing here. Faith that can move mountains. Faith that can see you in every storm and every tragedy, every, every, every setback every failure, everything that looks like it's coming against us. Give us the faith as parents and grandparents and extended family to know, God, that you're still on the throne and you're still at work in the lives of these children. And bless these moms and dads. I pray over those that are direct parents. God, give them what they need right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I pray over your grandparents and Extend it in right now. Do it for them in the name of Jesus. God, you're concerned, more concerned about this than you are how we feel on Monday morning. You're more concerned about this than you are how much money we make next week. You're more concerned about this uh, than, than our, than our vac- vacation plans. You're, you're more concerned about the next generation and our hand being upon them and your blessings flowing, God, I pray. Right now in the name of Jesus that you'll break chains and shackles uh, that you'll dissolve the work of the enemy that comes against the plan of God. I pray victory in every household. I pray victory in every parent. I pray victory in every conversation. I pray victory even when we feel like we're losing, God. Help us to realize we're not losers, uh, but we're victorious through Jesus Christ. And I pray the proof and the fruit would be seen. It might not be tomorrow. It might not be today. It might, might, might not be next year. But one day God will see the fruit of our labor as we train them up in the ways of the Lord. And you say when they're old God they will not depart. Strengthen. Strengthen us for the journey. Strengthen those that have been struggling for a long time. Strengthen them right now. In the name of Jesus. Would you just lift your hands and just receive the blessing right now? Just lift your hands and receive it. You prayed and asked for it, just begin to thank him for it. Because if you ask, you shall receive. Simple as that. You ask, you shall receive. Uh, Don't pray and not expect God to do something. He's going to do it. If you ask, expect an answer. If you knock on heaven's door, expect the door to be open. Because God is concerned about you. He's giving you the gift. And he's given you the ability to cherish the gift, to nurture the gift, to be responsible with the gift. And this is how the kingdom is expanded. This is how the kingdom grows. And may you be blessed every day of your parental life and beyond. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And God watch us as we leave this place. Whenever your presence, guide and lead and protect us. For the days ahead, in Jesus' name, and all God's people said amen, amen, Amen. Amen. and amen. Amen. Come on, put your hands together and give God a good praise as you leave the place today. To all of our guests and visitors, God bless you for being with us today.